is absolutely a hugest, hugest endodontic pleasure. Uh, I cannot believe I'm podcast interviewing Dr. Stephen Buchanan all the way from Santa Barbara, California. Uh, the funniest thing is my uh, classmate, uh, Stephanie Carmona, she's gone to all your stuff. And I said, uh, I said, you just learn a lot of endo? And she goes, uh, no, I just want to stare at Steve during the whole lecture. She just goes there. She, she says you're the most handsome, gorgeous lecturer of all time. But you don't need an introduction. Okay. Dr. Steve Buchanan is a diplomat of the American Board of Endodontics and an assistant clinical professor at the postgraduate endodontic programs at USC and UCLA. He maintains a private practice limited to endodontics and implant surgery in Santa Barbara, California, and is the founder of Dental Education Laboratories, a hands-on training center serving general dentists and endodontists upgrading their skills in new endodontic and implant technology. How are you doing? Doing great. I, uh, I think some of, the, some of the best hands-on endodontic courses I ever took in my 30-year career was at your place. I mean, you are just purely, I mean, it'd be an insult to call you a genius. So my first question is, what's, what's new in endodontics? There's a lot of it. Everything's new in endodontics. I think the only thing that's the same as when I got out of school is the anatomy. Even the <laughs> anesthesia is different. So uh, it's been a really fun 35 years so far. Uh, it's not just in uh, endo, obviously all dentistry is moving towards digital uh, workflows, um, 3D imaging, 3D uh, CAD CAM fabrication of uh, prosthetic structures, CT drill guides, um, and, and we're also in 3D in education now too. We're uh, using uh, 3D printed replicas to teach people how to do root canal treatment and implant surgery. Yeah, I remember way back in the day, I think the first time I ever heard of a CAT scan was not in a hospital or healthcare. It was actually you CAT scanning teeth. <laughs> right. We were doing industrial CT scans of extracted teeth in, from 1988 to 1991 and when we actually got it to work. And uh, back then when we would reconstruct teeth, it took two hours to reconstruct one tooth in three dimensions. And now it takes two and a half minutes on a CT scanner that uh, fits in my hallway. So it's, pretty, it's been a pretty huge change over the time. And I remember reconstructing those and looking at this anatomy and going, uh, thinking to myself, what would it be like if you could actually have this before you headed into a patient's root canal? That would be almost unfair advantage. And now uh, I wouldn't do root canal without it. So, so, so let, me, let me ask you a couple uh, succinct questions. Uh, a lot of things have changed in endodontics as far as billing goes. You see a lot less um, billings for apicoectomies and retrofills. Uh, which have now, um, a lot of people say that's because that's just turned into, if a root canal fails, they just pull it out and place titanium. Do you, do you see that trend or not really? God, great question, Howard. Uh, that's mainly a trend because we quit teaching endodontic graduate students how to do ankle surgery. And why did you quit teaching them that? <laughs> <laughs> it's an ironic story. So a friend of mine, Gary Carr from San Diego, brought microscopes and ultrasonics into endo as uh, tools to do better apical surgery because we were trying to use those little mini head hand pieces that always clutched up and you didn't have enough room to use them. With ultrasonics, you could have a, a tip that actually came back action so you could get it in, up and in the end of any root canal and you had a microscope so you could see everything in high def, really, really small things, really big. Um, and so the law of unintended consequences came to play, and after we had these two tools, we found that we could also do more conventional retreats, and that we could vibrate posts out with ultrasonics, we could get broken files out many times. Uh, with a microscope, we could find calcified canals, whereas we would do apical surgery sooner. Um, also, we became more aware of the fact, uh, the limitations of our previous surgical tools and techniques, and how often that failed. Um, and one of the primary issues was that we were doing ankle surgery on uh, leaking root canal treatments and putting a retro seal on a leaking infected root really didn't work. And so then the pendulum swung the other way and everybody said in the grad programs, well, we're never going to do ankle surgery unless we do a conventional retreat first. And you're only in grad school for two years. And after you do the conventional retreat, it takes a year to two years for it to fail. So uh, a lot of times you never get the chance to give it another try. And so, um, whereas I had done 10 April procedures in my undergrad program at UOP before I left for Temple University, and probably 20 to 25 cases uh, in grad school, a lot of grad students get out having done five or fewer April surgeries, and you only do, you only treatment plan the procedures you know how to do. So there are some cases where, and, and 
I'm a big fan of retreating conventionally when you don't have a, an intact and confirmed coronal seal, but there's some cases where a patient will have a beautiful pose, great uh, core buildup, a fantastic crown, the, the shade matches on a central incisor, and they're disassembling it to do a conventional retreat when it would be like a 15-20 minute procedure to put a retrofill on because whoever did the endo treated it short. So while endo is not something you do instead of the right thing to do in a retreat case, um, it's certainly sometimes the most uh, Sometimes I present that as the easiest option, and if it doesn't work, then we can go ahead and tear everything apart and redo the conventional part of it, bang the posts out, take the broken files out, get the buildup and, and, and the crown off, and then, of course, everything has to be rebuilt. So when you are doing conventional deconstruction like that, um, that pushes, the, that pushes the, the, the decision tree, I think, inevitably more towards, well, really, do we want to disassemble this whole thing and reassemble it when we could just put an implant in. And I do both procedures now, so um, I'm unbiased. I'm, I'm just there to give them the best outcome that they can have. Um, but uh, saving a tooth is still the simplest, cheapest, most predictable thing to do for a patient. Well, um, do you care if I call you Steve? Pardon? Do you, go, do you prefer to go by Steve or Dr. Buchanan? Steve. Steve, um, the... Um, most podcasters are under 30. I, 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 it look, looks like probably 95% of them are under 30. And one of the biggest questions they get stressed about is um, the oral surgeon of the periodontist is saying, pull it, uh, this root canal has failed, pull it, do an implant. The endodontist is saying, save it. Um, what, 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 how can you help a young 30-year-old dentist decide that, you know, this tooth, it's it's – had too much stuff. Let's let's pull it and be. And, and then a lot of times people say, well, the the implant's more predictable than the retreat. So mm -hmm. can you give some guidance to young dentists yeah. on when to retreat and when to place titanium? There's a this is a there's a lot of different variables associated with making this decision. Uh, one of them is uh, retreats aren't all the same. Depends on who's got the their hand on the handpiece, and it's not just hand skills. It's you know I would say. Heart is as important as, as hands and head. Like how, how much do you care about the outcome? Are you willing to see the patient another time? Are you willing to spend the extra time to do the harder thing because you think it's going to improve the outcome? If you're that person, then uh, you really just need to evaluate what's the best in the pa patient's best interest. And uh, I wouldn't ask an implant surgeon that. Um, they only see endo cases that fail. Nobody ever sent them a case that was a beautiful retreat that was magnificently successful for consultation um, because if they did, the oral surgeon call would say, um, well, I have your patient in here and we're looking at number 14 and it looks, it looks healthy and happy. There's a root canal in it. Why did you refer it to me? And my fantasy life includes saying, yeah, that's how they look when they're done right. They always work. <laughs> so they, they just see the ones that fail. Um, I think my colleagues in the specialty bear some responsibility in uh, when you can't do an implant, everything looks like a root canal, uh, just like if you can't do a root canal, everything looks like an implant. So for those of us who can't do either procedure, um, there's a tendency to say, you know what, I'm really, I'm really thorough and, and uh, adept. I get a lot of high success retreats. Uh, this thing's been retreated three or four times. Let me just give it a try and see what happens. My rule is three strikes and you're out. If it's been treated even twice, um, depending on the structural integrity issues, uh, what's left of the tooth structurally, uh, I don't think it's serving the patient well to, to continue to do endodontic therapy. So the best uh, the, to, to these 30-year-old uh, dentists, um, find an endodontist that does implant surgery because they're the only unbiased uh, opinion you'll get. Basically. Okay, and... Um True, true or false, in 2016, to do great molar endo to the level of the specialist, would you have to have a CBCT of that tooth before? Uh, because true or false, the number one cause of a failed root canal is a missed canal. And a CBCT would help you with a three-dimensional find that fourth or fifth canal. Well, of course, those are all true statements. Um, but, you know, for most of my career... Uh, at least the first half of it, we didn't have CBCT imaging, um, and you have to take off angle radiographs. You know, if you 
Don't know if there's an MB2 in an upper molar. Put a file on the MB1 that you found. Take a shallow distal view. Turn that MB root sideways, and you'll see if the file's off-center. If it's off-center, you have another canal. So, no, you don't have to have one. I'm just lazy. It's just like, uh, it's really, I, I, I love walking into the operatory when I'm treating an upper molar and going like, I know for sure there's no MB2. It's like it's like such a happy day. It's like I'm not going to look for it. I'm not going to cut a bunch of dentin. I'm not going to fuss about it and worry about it later because I couldn't find it. I'm, I'm worried that it's still there. So in terms of being definitive and spending less time in treatment, uh, I, I would rather give you back my microscope. Well, I actually have gotten rid of my microscope. I'd rather give you back my magnification system than my CBCT machine if I could only have one. What you see behind me is uh, my 3D camera. I just uh, sold my Zeiss microscope, which was uh, Pro Ergo Zeiss. It looks like this monster thing hanging out of the ceiling. And now it's just this uh, four-inch cube right here. Uh, and that's, that's what all my uh, data capture is. And I do my procedures now looking at the monitor you see behind me. And what, what is the name of that, that system? That's a Mora Vision uh, 3D camera system by my friend Asad Mora, who's a prosthodontist in Santa Barbara. And... Does He's he? a hack job inventor like myself and um, spent eight years perfecting something that would have never been designed as well by an optical engineer. Um, his, his, uh, his clinicalness, <laughs> his clinical uh, requirements were really what drove this to be such an elegant system, and, uh, and I'm a big fan of it. I think, I think this is going to serve uh, general dentistry 100% uh, 90, better than microscopes ever did. I can place this camera over my patient's torso, aim it up, and do maxillary access cavities with no mirror. And one of the problems with microscopes, the reason that they were so huge in endodontics and really didn't take hold in the rest of dentistry, I think less than 3% of general dentists use a microscope. Almost none of the implant surgeons, uh, like a half percent of the periodontists do. It's because in endo, we do everything through this little tiny hole so if you only have a 15 degree of deflection and still be able to get your eyes in the eyepieces, um, it's okay for us in a dentist, even if we're doing apical surgery. You know, it's on the side, but it's still only that big. And having, a, you know, a limited range of mobility is not, a bit, not as big a deal. For general dentistry, for implant surgery especially, uh, you have to have a greater depth of field. Um, you have to be able to put it anywhere around the patient's head if you really want to have decent magnification. So, uh, you know... Uh, many is a slip between the cup and the lip, but my uh, pr my prediction is this is going to take general dentistry by storm in a way the microscopes never did. And who's the inventor? Asad Mora. Asad from Santa Barbara, California. A S S A D and then M O M O R A Mora. M O R A, and that's at www.moravision.com. M O R A Vision.com. Yes, but if you look at, uh, it's being sold through dentalcadre.com, D-E-N-T-A-L-C-A-D-R-E. Let me, uh, I saw on the website, uh, J-Dent, D-E, but that's not it. I'm sorry? Um, it, it's sold by what, www.what? It's by dentalcadre.com. Dentalcadre.com, and how much is it? Uh, they're not cheap, they're 38500 but my uh, pro ergo Zeiss was seventy thousand dollars. I sold it used and had change afterwards. That that doesn't relate to most general dentists, but uh, I do think endodontists are going to find the the value prop is really good. Um, and uh, there are a lot of super general GPs that uh, that are looking for something uh, better in terms of how they're presenting their cases. Patients love it. I mean, I put I'll put a loved one in uh, in the easy chair next to. Uh, uh, in front of the screen and have them wear 3D glasses and, and they'll watch procedure if they're kind of technically, technically oriented that way. I need to disclose that uh, I got so excited about this, I begged him to let me uh, sell it through uh, dental education laboratories and ended up in a different part of uh, my business side. So I am the owner of Dental Cadre. We are the sales organization for this simply because um, – I'm a good opinion leader in terms of uh, new technology. So. Well, let me be your – you didn't ask for my advice. But you know what my advice would be to you then? What? Dental, Dentaltown uh, passed uh, 218,000 users. We started in 1998 mm -hmm. uh, when your uh, neighbor Steve Jobs shoved the internet in the uh, Motorola Nikon phone. 
2008 with the uh, iPhone, we started the Dental Town app. That's now at 50,000. But we put um, online CE courses, and we put up 400 courses, and they've been viewed 600,000 times. If you uh, if, if you did a uh, well. Yeah. Well, millennials and um, Generation Xers, they, they love online CE. You know that more than anybody. Um, yeah, if you if you put a, a, a online CE course on there, not only would it raise the credibility of our online CE department all the way to the moon, uh, but I'm sure you'd get a ton of exposure with your new camera system. Great. I'm up, I'm up for it. Right I'm on. Uh, I... I... I, I, I love doing the new thing. So, I, I wonder, in fact, uh, I love what you talked about. The millennials, uh, one of the cool things has been as I've expanded my online presence, which is light years behind yours. But um, now three quarters of all my course participants, and we give a course once or twice a month, is a dentist out of school less than five or ten years. So, And um, that's at DEL Endo? Yeah, Dental Education Laboratories. If well, you, you already got a ton of courses. Yeah, what you should do is put it. Um, what? How long are your your programs? They're two day courses. Um, they're all hands on. All the didactics is given to them pre uh, pre course for them to study. They're recommended to review it three to four times because it's all I'm demonstrating or they're doing. It's not this uh, day and a half of blah 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 blah, and then you get a half a day of lab. It's two days of lab, and I usually do a one visit molar in in this facility. They're all wet, wearing their little three D glasses, which looks so nerdy. I just love that. Um, but they, they get a big kick out of it. It's, it's a lot of fun. We've been doing that for like 28 years or something. I've, I've taught a lot of dentists over the years. It's, yeah, the, the you know, it's the funny best. how it kind of slips by you. <laughs> yeah, I, I loved your uh, your labs uh, and I took those. Uh, I still have one nightmare of, the, of a two-day course I took at your place. One of your class participants was uh, uh, what the heck was his name? Um, uh, Chip Casting out of Bakersfield, California. And he said, um, after the deal, he says, what are you doing tonight? He says, uh, let's fly back to Bakersfield and we'll play around. I got an airplane. So I said, okay. So we went to his airplane, Santa Barbara. He takes off. And as soon as he takes off, he puts his hands behind his head. And he says, Howie, we're either going to die or you're going to drive that airplane all the way to, and, oh, my God. And uh, he landed it, but he forced me. Uh, but anyway, your, your course is amazing. Do you think you'll, you'll ever hook that up to uh, that, that new 3D Oculus Rift? Have you That's seen right. that? Have yeah, you seen that yeah. new 3D Oculus Rift? Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll ever be able to plug that uh, camera into the 3D goggles? Absolutely. We can already do that. Oh, my God. That would so be so. I don't have them working right now. Or I'd hold them up and show them to you. But, uh, yeah, my patient's going to wear 3D goggles and watch the procedure. You know what you should do? Hmm. Ever since uh, Ryan got the Oculus Rift, we've been saying Dental Town uh, should do something. You should do the first online course on Dental Town that you view through the Oculus Rift? Well, I just want to have a cover picture of me uh, treat a patient wearing 3D go of VR goggles. <laughs> hey, I want to go back. Put your dad hat on. Um, you got a young daughter. She just walked out of dental school at 25. They learn these one-liners like, quote, all root canal teeth need a crown. And then she, said, then she says on Dental Town, you know, I did – there was root canal number 24. By the time I prepped it for a crown – and had it all prepped and everything, it looked like it was a grain of rice. So my right. question to you is, do all root canal to treated teeth need a crown? Uh, anterior teeth, definitely not. You only do a crown on an endodontically treated anterior tooth because it needs a crown, regardless of the endo. Obviously, you make an axis cavity, and then you peel a millimeter and a third all the way around, you know, 180 of the tooth. That's even in maxillary anterior teeth, that's, that's like a, less than a millimeter of tooth structure around the axis cavity, even if you're being conservative about that. So when you say anterior teeth, are you, does that include canine or are you just talking incisors? Cuspids and cuspids, anteriors, uh, incisors and cuspids. They don't need crowns. The only reason we need crowns as opposed to your teeth is because we have two, a buccal and lingual cusp set, and we have a, 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 a cusp coming down from the opposing tooth or going up that wants to spread the tooth. Um, if, uh, if you only have one cusp, so lower, uh, lower first premolars, you don't need to crown on those. They only have one cusp, most, uh, almost. The second premolars, uh, you can fracture those, but almost the majority of premolars that are fractured that split into the root are, are, are the upper ones with those two big buccal and lingual cusps. Uh, molars, of course, um, uh, 
very much the safest thing to do. It depends also on your patient's uh, parafunctional habits. Do they cleanse their teeth or are they uh, bruxing them? Uh, the more of that they do, the more critical it is. And in fact, those are people who uh, probably need full crowns of teeth that haven't been endodontically treated in, in the molar region if they've lost a tooth or two to a roof fracture. Um, I treat a kid, uh, gosh, uh, a full ride uh, a soccer player to Stanford. Uh, we had to do a root canal on him the, the, the day before he left for soccer camp. And uh, he, had the, he had just this little pinhole decay that came through a, a central fossa and uh, just got inside of it. I think he had sealants. So it was really a, a very minimally invasive carious defect, but it killed his pulp. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm talking to the restorative dentist. I'm not convinced that he needs a crown on that tooth. I put a bonded composite restoration in there. Um, I'm a big fan of sandblasting and, and getting a really nice uh, bonding surface to put that onto. And he's got no wear facets. So that's a, that's a gray area. But... Cuspid to cuspid, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Here's, here's another uh, confusing question. I've seen this thread on dental town multiple times. Uh, young dentist reads a paper that says um, um, root canals are usually, molar root canals are usually failing from the, the final restoration. Uh, they send it to an endodontist. Um, they, they, um, they reach you to the top of the crown. And then they're wondering, well, if the restoration is leaking, why did you go through the crown wouldn't you have taken the crown out? Or, but basically, so I'm asking you, that for a proper retreat, should the tooth be deconstructed? I mean, you have as a crown, should the crown come off? If there's an MOD composite, should the whole darn thing come out? Can you really do a retreat through a Stevie Wonder crown and amalgam and just go right through it? Can you do that, or does that need to yeah. be all taken out? Well, first off, uh, the majority of teeth don't fail due to coronal leakage. If it's been successful for five years uh, and then it fails, I likely there's some leakage going on there. Um, and it could be simply through the previous core made in the, if half of all the teeth we treat, you usually already have a crown on them. And so if the core buildup is failing, it may not be the crown that's leaking, it's the post-endodontic restorative treatment. Um, I think most endos fail due to undertreated root canal spaces, in my experience. Okay, I'm just gonna- and of course, as you said at the very start of this, you know, you miss one of the, one of the four canals, uh, you can be God's gift to endo and uh, do the most amazing job, fill 15 lateral canals off the other three canals. You leave one of those primary canals untreated, it's failing. It's going down in flames. So missed canals uh, are the primary situation. That's what makes upper molar so hard. And, of course, lateral and accessory canals. I did a root canal on my, my receptionist, found an MB2, uh, merged with the MB1, bifurcated again. I actually did it as a live demonstration for my course since I had to do the free root canal anyway. Um, and six months later, she comes out and goes, hey, my tooth is hurting and biting pressure, the one you did the root canal on. And she had an MB3. It's like unbelievable. So um, so it's all about the anatomy. Um, you know, the holistic dentists that uh, make everybody have their teeth extracted rather than have a root canal because we can never hope to clean all the recesses of a root canal. Um they're full of it, but if you're not doing it through a job in your irrigation, uh, they're actually right. Well, I, well, you open that Pandora's box, not me, but I'll have to follow it. Lots of us um, have patients. I mean, I, I still practice in Phoenix, Arizona. Patients come in with articles printed out from Dr. Mercola, and then the article says 99.9% .9 of all cancer patients have this procedure, and then it's a root canal. Then it goes on and on forever. That, that ended you know on that a cheat. 100% of all prostitutes start out kissing? <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm sorry. Bad example, but <laughs> it's just stupid. It's stupid. So <laughs> well, what, what do you – what do you have you heard of Dr. Mercola? I a cigarette beforehand. Have, have, <laughs> you, have you heard of Dr. Mercola in these claims? Uh, I'm, I, I was I, – I haven't specifically checked him out. But what, but what do you what, what do you think of the people coming in that saying um, root canals um, leave uh, periapical infection and it's spreading throughout toxins throughout the body and uh, that they we're living through a post science culture that has given up on organized religion and, and just made up a bunch of stuff to fill their spiritual void. 
I'll, you can quote me on that. And so you hear people who don't know anything about science talking about what it is we're going to do to save the earth when they don't know. We're wasting money on things that aren't going to save the earth when we need to do other things to save the earth. Um, it's true of healthcare situations as well. Um, and then you ask them, well, here's all the science related to that. And then eventually they come up to a, th a point where they just say, it's just what I believe. And then at that point you go, oh, sorry, it's, it's your, you know, uh, uh, it's your, uh, uh, it's your secular religion. So let's not talk about politics or religion and yours happens to involve healthcare. So, um, there's some things you can't fix about that, I guess is the point I'm making. Uh, I always joke that if, uh, if your patient uses the specific words for your materials and tools and they're not in the healthcare business or they're not related to a dentist, it's not good news. <laughs> if they say the word eugenol, if they talk about accessory canals and uh, unless they've had 15 root canals and been, been uh, cued in and clued in uh, by, by their treating dentist, um, usually it means they're a little obsessive compulsive. They've been online and when you search root canals, it's sad, but the first thing you get is why you should have your teeth extracted if they need a root canal. Absolutely, and that's Dr. Mercola. Right. So, can't fix it. It's out there. All we can do is, uh, when we do root canals, do them well so that they don't have examples to sh show like, see, and here's another one of those, and my patient died of cancer, and they had a failing root canal. You know, you almost give up on the Internet when you search water fluoridation and have to go 85 pages into it before you find anything that's based on science. I mean, the first 80 pages are a communist plot, conspiracy. Imagine this. It, the fluoride is so toxic, there's no place they can put it on Earth, so they bribe the politicians to slowly pour it in the water because there's no other place on Earth they can they can uh, get rid of this stuff. And that's why they send it to Texas in, in the Southwest. I'm like, why don't <laughs> I'm like they can't go to the place where they detonated thermonuclear bombs above ground in Utah or Arizona. Really, they can't pour this shit there. That'd be my first guess to pour it. Hey, I want I want to hold I want to hold your take a different different tack on this and just uh, uh, use as an example all the other professions like lawyers. Uh, they all make more laws. They don't make fewer law laws. Maybe we just need to start promoting tooth decay. I just get it over with. <laughs> Tell them all their silver fillings are terrible. They all need to be removed. And uh, don't use fluoride. Jesus. Reducing this you, decay you so filled rate is like horrible. Um, I want to. I want to. being facetious. I want to hold your feet to the uh, the controversial things that kids under thirty are having. One of it is. Um, they hear, you know, two old guys that they're working for, and one says every every root canal need every uh, root canal needs a post buildup, and the other guy says, um, you know, anyway, they're they're confused by that. What I'm working for, I'm I'm 28. I'm working for a 60 year old guy. He says every root canal tooth needs a post. What would you say to that? If you're in a fee sensitive area and you got to put a post in there to uh, get a reasonable fee for doing the work involved, I can understand that. Uh, personally, I, I don't want to practice in that kind of an environment, but I see that a lot. Um, do you need a post and a tooth? You only need a post and a tooth to hold the coronal structures to the root structures after your finished treatment. So if you don't have enough to hang a crown on, you need a post. In molars, you can get enough resistance form uh, uh, just reaching below the gingival layer the cervical the cj line into the pulp chamber floor even reaching into the uh uh the orifices a millimeter uh and, and each of the orifices with bonded composite and the little sucker's never coming out so um do you need it uh if you do them correctly i don't have a beef with that it's a clinical decision but are you going to do it as a dogma i'm i'm kind of against any type of fundamentalism regardless of what kind it is and saying anything is all the time in every case is your first clue that somebody just is kind of intellectually lazy or could be, you know, incentivized in a different way. We're all trying to make a living and insurance companies are the, the, the dark force that we all have to work against. So I'm not being judgmental, just saying that that can be a case. Now, with that said, one of my best friends uh, of, uh, is an endodontist who's retired now, Denny Southern from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He put a post in every single root canal he ever did in his uh, his career, 
and he probably has the closest to 100% success rate of anybody I know. Now, he spent time, and he never cut a post base bigger than the coronal preparation for the root canal. He always prepped the post to fit in there, and, uh, and so if you're doing a good job of them, I don't have a problem with that. That's a clinical decision. Um, I am fond of uh, composite posts because they're so fast to get out if you're doing a retreat. I can get a composite post out with an LA access burr in about 15 seconds because it's got a non-cutting pilot tip that creates frictional heat. What's the www? What's, what's, a, what's the website for that post? That's a Kerr Endo product, LAX line angle extension. It's a guided access burr. For endo, uh, I, we use it for, uh, obviously, once you drop through the pulp chamber, drop that in, it rides around the pulp chamber perimeter and the pulp chamber floor and projects that uh, internal periphery, peripheral anatomy of the pulp chamber directly onto the cable surface. Uh, so that's for virgin teeth. But if you're doing a retreat and there's a composite uh, buildup in there, I just turn the water off, spin it on top of the composite, give it a little push after about five seconds, it drops the pulp chamber floor, I take three laps around, and all the buildups out of there, and I haven't reduced any tooth structure unnecessarily. If there's a post there, I cut them off at the orifice level, dimple it a little bit, turn, keep the water off, spin it up, and, it, and give it a little push, and it drops right through the composite post. Okay, so, I, want, I want you to help. Uh, help post and do a composite post. Okay, help her out with another decision. Uh, how many endo file systems do you think are on the market around the world today? A billion. And I so, don't know, it's a lot. So, so she's trying. How many implant to, systems are there, right? Well, there were 175 implant systems at the IDF meeting in Cologne last year. Can you believe that? 175. And they said there's going to be more uh, in 2017. But yeah. so she's she's at the IDF, and and you've done what? 10,000 root canals. Uh, she, 30 or 40. 000. 30 or 40,000 root canals. Help her pick out a file system. Mm, okay. Don't get a reciprocating system. That just is. Uh, meant to make files that could be designed better, work better, and they get somebody that already has an endo handpiece to buy one. Um, uh, one of the coolest ad advantages we had from rotary instrumentation we didn't even design for, and that was that as the debris is cut, it's actually captured in the flute spaces and pulled out, so all the dent and blockage incidents we had with hand filing, push-pull filing, were done, and uh, reciprocation is, you know, back to the few, back to the <laughs> Sorry, pass. It cuts dentin in a reverse direction and pushes debris ahead of the file. So don't do reciprocation. Um, you don't need a thirty-dollar file to do a one-visit endo. We were doing in single. I'm sorry, a single-file uh, canal shape. We were doing single-file canal shapes in 1996 uh, with GT files, and you know they're off patent. They're they're generic now. Everybody has a version of them. But um, one of the things that uh, when when uh, I designed GTXs as the next gen for Tulsa Densply, next generation of the GT files, um, they did not di get taken up as fast as we expected, and there were several reasons for that. Um, but one of them was uh, when I talked to Richard Fishbane, who's a marketing uh, data gatherer for dental companies. He looks at uh, dealer sales around the U.S. and tells them what how many of everything is being bought and sold, so they can they can track the other, their competitors, and I said, so you know a lot about new product development and introduction. Why why aren't they switching to GTX files? They said, you guys in Endo are, are really different than the composite people. Uh, all the new composites get tried because nobody's satisfied. Um, fairly simple endodontic files are doing an amazing job compared to what we did with hand files. So uh, everybody's kind of you know, fat and happy, they don't, they don't need a new file system because they're already cutting great shapes, shapes that are better than I used to cut when I was out of grad school. So um, the first thing is it's not about, the, it's not about how expensive the file is. Um, many files can be used with a single f uh, file shape. Um, I think what you need to be worried about is uh, the geometry of the files. As the files get larger in diameter at their tip size, they become stiffer. Um, and transportation is the thing you need to worry about. It's the unappreciated un, uh, cause of failure during instrumentation. We all fear breakage because you're immediately accountable, but when you wreck the end of a root canal because it's curved and you use a, a file that's too sharp and it 
you know, winds the end of the root canal open in a way that nobody could fill, um, that takes a year to fail. So after a year, you know, and, and then you can't even tell why it failed. All you can tell is maybe there's an overfill. So you got to choose the right files as they get larger in diameter. Once they get to a size 35 or 40, they're almost as stiff as stainless steel instruments. So um, if you talk to most of the endodontists in practice today, they're doing a hybrid system. So they're using uh, like a razor blade kind of flute um, in the small sizes. Um, I use uh, Vortex Blue 1506s, one of my primary files. That's a dense ply instrument. And then I will Is cut that my Tulsa dense shape. Blight? Tulsa dense ply? Tulsa dense ply, yeah. That's What's the name of it? Hmm? What's the name of that file? Vortex Blue. Vortex Blue, and where would you get that? Is it Densply? Tulsa Densply is a direct sales company. So TulsaDensply.com? Yes, and uh, I only use that size. Um, once I get to 25, they transport like crazy. So I'm using a hybrid system, which means really razor bladey, sharp files in the small sizes because they're so flexible, and then when, I, when I'm going to finish the shape, so I'm using usually two files for every canal prep, including most of negotiation. Um, and these 1506s actually are files that I use maybe half the time. They cut all the way to length, and I haven't put a single hand file in. They're pretty amazing. So I'll cut my initial shape. If, if it's going to cut to length, it's not too curved or doesn't have an impediment, that thing will get there and get an apex locator reading. I'm two-thirds the way to being completed in my shape. I'm going to use some nickel titanium K files and see which ones pass through the end of the root canal and what binds at length. That tells me the terminal diameter of the canal. I choose a finishing file with a land. It could be a GT file. It could be a GTX file. It could be a K3 file. Um, any landed blade instrument, they're not as efficient cutting, but if you've already roughed out the shape, then you find out what the terminal diameter is. You choose a finishing file that has that tip diameter, cut it to length, done. So I'm doing most of my canal shapes with two rotary files, and half the time, not a single hand file to cut down. And you're going to show that? Box. And you're going to show that all live on a Dental Town online CE course? Sure. It's on my website. You don't need – I'll give you a link to it. But I'll, well, no, what's your website? To it you Endo. It's on my, web, it's on my website, uh, Dental Education Laboratories, um, under free videos. And oh. it's a single file shaping case. Well, uh, um. True, true or false, um, all endophiles should be single use because it is the autoclaving them that is the number one cause of file breakage. Yeah, first part's true, second part's not. So it should be single use, but it's not because autoclaving causes file breakage. Well, why are files I, – I would think the number one fear of rotary instruments for a dentist, they don't right. want it to – is breaking a file. Yeah. You know the best trick um, to, to eliminate breakage in, in using rotary files? And I've, I've, you know, we talked about getting new files for every case, but then you still have cases, tough molars, that you have a brand new set of files and one of them comes apart. So, you know, what do you hang your hat on there? And uh, one of my uh, ex-grad students from USC um, uh, told me five years out of school that he had not broken a single rotary file. And I was like, wow, Ernest, uh, er Ernesto Roman, amazing guy. He used to be kind of a prosthodontist before he went to endo school, and just an amazing clinician from uh, Tampa, Florida. And I said, Ernesto, I'm embarrassed to tell you, like, I break a file every six months at least. How, did, how can you go five years and not break a file? He goes, well, Dr. Buchanan, when I was in grad school, I realized that every time I broke a file, I had this thought in my head before it happened, I wonder if this thing could come apart. And finally, I got tired of breaking files, and I just realized that if I have that thought, that's my subconscious brain telling me I need a new file. And so for like, you know, seven to nine bucks, I can have peace of mind just by putting a brand new file in there. And uh, then you can be mean to the files. Uh, the difference between the, the force you can put on a brand new file and one that's been, uh, that shaped a single small molar canal uh, is dramatic. I tell my course participants at, by three o'clock in the second day, if they haven't broken an instrument, I want them to do it on purpose and uh, preferably find two mesial canals of lower molar and take a file that's shaped two canals and see how much torque pressure it takes to break it and then take a brand new one and shape the adjacent one and see how tough they are. So we're taking uh, what used to be with a shoulder technique like 16 to 18 instruments serially stepping back to create shapes and root canals. It's being done with one or two or three instruments now. So to say that uh, you don't need a new file even more often than 
you know, once a case in three and four canal molars, it's not even slightly out of line. I mean, it's not, it's totally logical. So your first file was the Vortex Blue and your second file was what? I finished with GTX. I'm, I'm biased since I designed it, but um, <laughs> they're a lamp instrument and uh, okay. they have fluid diameter limitations so they don't overcut coronal shapes. I want to get your comment. The United Kingdom banned uh, sterilizing endodontic files after mad cow disease. They said That's that lovely. the autoclave could not get rid of prions, which is a protein particle that is believed to be the cause of brain disease such as BSC, Scrappy, Kreutzfeldt, Jacob disease. Prions are not visibly microscopically contained in glucic acid and are highly resistant to destruction. Do you think that was uh, necessary for the uh, United Kingdom to do that, or do you think that was not scientific? Could have been political. Um, the outcome of it is probably good, um, but um, they're the only country in the world that has done that so far. How many but, of your patients? Right. How many of I your really patients? I'm not a I'm not an expert on prions or Crisfield Jake or uh, disease. Um, they'll joke about mad cow disease as you know, God save the queen. But um, I think uh, I think I think if you're treating my daughter with a file that's been crudded up by somebody else's uh, organic material in their blood from their bloodstream, I don't want you using that file again in my daughter's tooth. I think that's gross. I know a patient who went off the, she went off the deep end when she found out her daughter's braces had been used uh, on another patient. <laughs> the brackets had been used. Yeah, he, he, the, the orthodontist autoclaved the brackets and reused them, and she just about lost it. Uh, yeah. That's, that's, that's uh, despicable. Okay, another, another – uh, it's, like it's, it's not like we don't make a good living in dentistry. We're, we make an amazingly good living in dentistry, and so um, – one of the things around uh, thoughts that I share with people around when you get a new file um, and, and when can you use it again, it's like uh, just remind them, why do you like doing endo so much? Uh, not because it's so easy, but because the overhead's so low compared to all the rest of dentistry, restorative dentistry, everything except extractions or a higher overhead than endo. So don't be cheap. You know, It's already a great procedure. You're making a lot of money. You're making $500 to $1,000 an hour. And to sit there and try and squeeze five bucks more out of a case just speaks poorly of your character. Okay. Right. Do you, um, another another question. Um, what um, do you think endodontists should learn how to place implants? Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay, talk about that. Uh, I've been doing implant surgery for twelve years. It's now forty percent of my practice. It's the coolest thing I ever did in in my specialty. It has made me a better endodontist. It has made me. Uh, taught me how to make decisions more in line with uh, the restorative dentist. If you're an endodontist, you don't do implant surgery. Uh, everything you see that you can save, you want to save. When you're thinking more along the lines of uh, multiple procedural options and you do treatment plan, what you know how to do, uh, then when you listen to a, a, a prosthodontist say, no, I just need that tooth out of there because it's wrecking the whole treatment plan in the mandibular arch, you're not sitting there going like, no, we can do a root canal. It's like you're talking to him about like okay that's your treatment plan just tell me how I can support you know what you want to do for this patient so there's a, there's a lot of different reasons that um, it's great for endodontists to do implant surgery the first one is they're unbiased they can do either procedure I don't know any implant surgeons who know how to do endo but I know an increasing number of endodontists that know how to do implant surgery and uh, root canals are really complicated implants take three drills they're all straight you just have to get them in the right place and if you do CT guided Every single case turns out perfect. So um, it's not, I'm not saying it's easy. It's a very complicated, there's a lot of technique and there's a lot of knowledge re required to do sophisticated cases. But um, endodontist doing implant surgery is fabulous. Uh, 25 to 40% of the consults that refer to me for a, a judgment on whether this tooth should be saved or not can't be saved. And I'd be doing them a disservice by, you know, let's do the third or fourth retreat or uh, let's retreat this tooth and hopefully it doesn't have a roof fracture and I don't have a CT machine so I don't know. But um, if 25 to 40% of my cases can't have their tooth, patients can't have their tooth saved with a root canal, uh, do they really want to meet another specialist? And the answer is none of them want to meet another specialist. So when I tell them 
that we can take care of that problem uh, that they have it by replacing it with an implant. Uh, they love me. I've never had a referring dentist except one out of 100, and 100 plus dentists I work with in Santa Barbara. Only one ever said, no, I want them to have the implant done by somebody else. It's not like we're doing full mouth cases, okay? We're not doing full uh, hybrid denture cases, although I've done, I, I did one of those in November. Um, we're doing one and two at the most three implant placements, and uh, if, even if you just do model-based drill guides, your first implant can turn out perfectly, and if I'm a referring dentist, and I don't do either endo, or I don't do molar tough endo, and I don't do implant surgery, I don't want to spend another bunch of my time referring them to somebody else. Uh, there's no benefit to me. So referring dentists like it. The only people that don't like it are oral surgeons and sometimes periodontists. Okay, but are a little nicer about it than the oral surgeons. The oral surgeons are kind of mean sometimes. Okay, well, you just opened up a lot of questions for my homies. They're thinking, okay, what CBC did you go with? What surgical guy did you go with? And what implant did you go with? Help them make decisions. Okay. Yes, good questions. Well done. <laughs> You've done this before. Um, and you obviously know what the zeitgeist uh, out there is looking for in terms of questions and answers. Um, uh, I think... The, I think the finest, uh, highest resolution CT machine on the market is J. Morita's uh, R100. That's what I have. I've used uh, their AccuTomo before that. Uh, the R100 casts a beam that's no more than four feet away from the machine, so it goes in my in my hallway instead of taking a whole room that's down my handicapped bathroom um, and a Lux one at that. Um, I scan everybody. That's just kind of an aside, but uh, it's like microscopes. So I got my microscope and used it on those cases where I needed a microscope until I realized I'm an idiot. Uh, I can do better work if I use it on all my cases. So every patient gets scanned here. It's a seven and a half second scan. Um, if they have financial issues, I'll scan them for free because it makes my job easier. Um, uh, in terms of guided surgery, um, I think for general dentists and in a dentist doing single implant replacement um, or in a, into additional spaces, the easiest thing you can do is a model-based drill guide. Nobel has an awesome model-based drill guide abutment set and, and replicas. Uh, Nobel? Nobel. And uh, the salespeople don't know about it and, uh, because no implant surgeon's ever asked to use it. But they have an abutment that's 10 millimeters up from the, plant, the uh, uh, analog surface. And you set the abutment in there, it holds the guide ring with a little nut on top of it. You use triad light cure acrylic to make the drill guide. Uh, put it in an easy bake oven, take it out, spin the little nut above it off, lift the drill guide off the abutment, and you're as good as, you know, CT guided if you can figure out where the bone and the root is. Um, I set my cases up on models by marking all the landmarks. Uh, I'm going to have the radiograph blown up there, and I'm going to actually draw on the side of the model the stone model where the roots are, the adjacent teeth. Um, and I can see things better with the model than I can in their mouth. So even if it's a second molar and I can't really fit the drills, which are longer for guided, back there, um, I've already done the case on a, on a model, and um, I'm much more, much more, more much better informed about how to get that implant in there as perfect as possible. But uh, when you can fit the drills in there, What's easier than putting a drill guide there that you could noodle around it with as long as you want, put it on your uh, surveyor, get it exactly through the, you know, I, I usually, uh, if it's a tooth, we're going to extract, and then I'm going to do a suck down or put a denture tooth in there and do a suck down, put a hole where the central fossa of the tooth, I'm going to have my surveyor guide go through that, and then I'm going to move the model around so that the angle is perfect in the X, Y, Z, and lock it down, put it in a, little drill press, a $99 Craftsman drill press, drill a hole for the analog, put it in there, put light cure acrylic, bond the thing in there where I want it, and then I make my drill guide. And so when I walk into the operatory, I set that thing on the patient's teeth, put a series of drills through there, it always turns out the same way. So that's my first recommendation. It takes 15 to 20 minutes to make those after you know what you're doing. It's probably an hour the first four or five times. Um, if you're doing multiple implants, uh, like the full mouth 13 implant case I did in November, uh, you're doing CT guided. Everything's going to be perfectly set up in three-dimensional virtual space. And uh, again, the only way you do put 13 implants in in less than 20 hours is, is guided. And then they're all per perfectly parallel. 
Uh, your prosthodontist loves you and life is sweet. So um, guides, I'm a big fan of drill guides. When you talk to, uh, oh, we're running, running out of time. I got a patient coming in. Oh, man. Um, God. So, so, so let me get right. Um, what, to my homies listening to you, that last technique, um, tell them what's on DELendo.com. What, what, what can they find on your website? We have, uh, we have a lot of, uh, uh, we have a lot of clinical data, um, training, uh, training modules, uh, clinical tips, no charge. We, you can take uh, courses on there uh, for no charge and get CD units. Um, you can read monographs of articles I've written for Dentistry Today over the last uh, 25 years. Um, I think it's a really good website, and it's getting better every day. Well, I think uh, great, you mar- asking, no. great marketing for it would be to put an online C course on Dental Town because we've, uh, there's uh, 217,000 dentists on there, and they'll, they'll, uh, you know, they're, they're serving on everybody. I want, la- last one question. I know you have a patient. Uh, you told me I could only get you for 30 minutes. I've stole 50 minutes of, uh, Let's do it again. of, of your time. Oh, I'll do it anytime, dude. Okay. Anytime. Uh, you got my email. Uh, but one last question. Put your dad hat on. Okay. So many kids walk out of dental school, 25 years old. They need to pay their student loans. The thing about root canals, they don't have to sell you a veneer, cosmetics. You know, you're coming in saying, I hurt, and insurance pays 80%. And they say, Howard, I hate endo. So many kids walk out of dental school and they say, I wish I could do it. It's $1,000, insurance pays 80 but I hate it. What would you tell a 25-year-old kid that says they hate endo? You just don't have enough training. There's no reason to hate it if you know what you're doing. If anything you can do and look really competent at and make a great living at, you're not going to hate it. You only you, you only hate it if like if you know if I'm supposed to get on a skateboard and do a big jump, I'm going to hate that because I, I don't know how to do that without getting hurt. Um, so if you went to a dental school that has a big grad program, they taught you how to refer. Right. So exactly. the biggest my my biggest. Uh, mission statement in my uh, professional educational career is I, I'm filling in the gap for people that didn't get trained enough in, in dental school. And I, w- I want to say to my homies out there, I've been around the sun uh, 30 times since I graduated from dental school, and I don't know a single person that didn't fall in love with you personally as a leader. You're like the Vince Lombardi. They love your personality. They love you, the man. They love your endo. No one walks out of Santa Barbara not being a better and an honest and loving it more. And uh, thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. I mean, every time you help a dentist, that helps their 3,500 uh, people in their neighborhood. And I, I, I think you're the uh, the greatest thing that ever hit endodontics. That's very kind of you. Thank you. It's an honor to be a part of uh, what you're doing there. And I think uh, I think you're you're providing such an amazing service. And I really like, uh, especially like the focus you have on the, the young dentist getting out of out of school because they're the ones that, they're the ones that need the most help. But what we're seeing today is dentists who spend the, the the ten years after dental school becoming really adept at each of the areas of dentistry, becoming an assess it's it's getting a little cliche, but becoming super GPs to where they're doing most of the procedures out there and they're referring the tough stuff out and that's a that's a lot of fun. So okay, and, option. So- and now you got to say happy birthday to Stephanie Carmada, who's 54 years old and thinks you're the greatest person on earth. Happy birthday. I All right, buddy. Be your head. All right. Thanks Thank a lot. You. And uh, if you ever get time to put one of your courses on Dental Town, it would just be unreal. We would All love right. it so much. It's a commitment. We'll figure it out. All right, buddy. Have a great day. Good luck on that patient. All right. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye.